you know, going through the process of having therapy, I had two therapists, one through a domestic violence charity who were amazing. And I also mm -hmm. had some group support with other women who'd been through similar experiences. Mm -hmm. And that was also so empowering mm -hmm. and so helpful for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I learned so much about myself. I feel like I'm a much truer version of myself now than I was before all of this happened. I think mm -hmm. it's been amazing to be able to open up and understand my childhood and how that impacts mm -hmm. on my uh, adult life and my decisions and how I behave and the things that I do and the choices I make. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as the catalyst to going into therapy was horrendous and yeah. I wouldn't you know, choose yeah. it or, or recommend it to anyone, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm grateful that I've got to where I am now. You know, I feel that therapy has been hugely helpful for me in lots of different ways. Hello, I'm Dr. Sherry Jacobson, and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to demystifying therapy, mental health, and the art of well-being. In this episode, we are joined by expert dietitian Sophie Medlin to talk about her personal experiences. So hello Sophie. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Of course. So I'm a dietitian. I trained as a dietitian before it was fashionable to be a dietitian. So I've been in, I was a strange 15 year old child who knew this is what I wanted to do. So I went into the, I trained for four years, went into the NHS and worked in hospitals for about seven or eight years, um, which was amazing and I loved it. But then I had the opportunity to go and lecture and research in my subject at an uh, institution at a university. So I did that for five years, most recently at King's College in London. Um, and then about a year ago, I decided that that wasn't really for me anymore. And I started my own business and quit sort of full-time um, employment. And so now I work as a consultant dietitian I look after patients one-on-one -on -one in my clinic. Um, I also do consultancy for product development and people like that. So new startup businesses who are interested in the nutrition space. And I do quite a lot of media work. So podcasts like this, but also things mm. like TV work and radio work and those sorts of things. Mm. Keeps so, me busy. Very busy, full on. So you're with City Dietitians. That's right, that's my business, yeah. That's right, the business. And um, what, what kind of clients come your way? So what we've done with city dietitians is try mm. to make sure there is a, a specialist dietitian, so a consultant dietitian for each condition. So nutrition is such a broad subject mm. and often dietitians can be sort of doing a bit of jack of all trades, master of none type work, especially in the private sector. What we've done is make sure that our dietitians are all specialists in their particular clinical area. Mm. So I look after uh, patients who have bowel conditions. So my consultant speciality is colorectal uh, disease and mm. specifically following colorectal surgery. So we help to manage those things, help to manage people's quality of life as well as their nutritional adequacy in my clinics. And I also look after women's relationship with food, which maybe we'll talk a bit more about later. Mm. So when people get a bit stuck with that disordered eating, not quite eating disorders, but just really uh, difficult thoughts and feelings about food that are maybe occupying far too much of their mental space. Mm. So we look after that side of things as well. My business partner, Dr. Nicola Guess, is a diabetes specialist dietitian. We have someone who's a specialist in intermittent fasting. We have a children's dietitian. We have an eating disorders dietitian. So we all do mm. our own very high level consultancy work with those individual mm. patients rather than trying to do a bit of everything. What the main difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian? Yeah, great question. So nutritionists, do both nutritionists and dietitians train mm. in the science of nutrition. Dietitians then go on to learn how to apply that to medicine. So if you have a, a problem that you want nutritional help with that you would see your doctor for, you need a dietitian, mm. not a nutritionist. So nutritionists are trained to work with healthy people. So maybe to make healthier people healthier or uh, work in public health or in product mm. development, those kinds of things. Dietitians are trained to work with sick people in hospitals. So nutritionists, yeah. dietitians do an extra bit of their degree that nutritionists don't do, which allows mm. us to be employed by the NHS and work with consultants and medical mm. people in that way. The other big mm. difference is that anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. So unfortunately, it's not a protected yeah. title at the moment, yeah. whereas only a dietitian can call themselves a dietitian in the same way a doctor can only call themselves a doctor, a medical doctor. Anyone can say they're a nutritionist and start doing whatever they want to do. Is there a difference in price generally in the private sector? 
It varies massively. Mm. It varies massively. What you'll probably find is that dietitians actually pr underprice themselves because we're used to NHS backgrounds yeah. and used to being paid very little. Yeah. So we're very grateful for any money that comes yeah. along, really. Yeah. Whereas I think uh, nutritionists have to be very commercial. They have to be very um, business minded because there's not really mm. a, a set career path. So if they've gone into private practice, mm. they have really had to work very hard to get there. Mm. I would love to hear your views on sort of trends and like overview. I mean, obviously, recommendations are going to be condition specific and person specific. Are there themes and trends, including the good old one plant based diet? Are there general recommendations that are out there? So there certainly are. And I think when we think about things like the plant based diet, it's important to remember that everyone thinks we should eat more vegetables. The one thing everyone can agree on is that everyone should be eating more fruits and vegetables and more plants. Right. The things no one agrees on is things like um, whether we should be so polarised that we don't eat, therefore don't eat any, any animal products. Mm -hmm. Or we go the other way and there's also the, polo, um, the paleo community and the low mm. carb community. There's lots of medical doctors who get very little nutrition education saying everyone should be a low carb person, which ultimately usually means more animal products. And there's also lots of doctors who are saying everyone should be vegan. And of course that means no animal products, but lots of carbohydrates. So there's very little kind of... Um, what's the word, cohesion with what people, the messages that medical people are putting out there at the moment in mm. terms of nutrition. And of course, the truth and the best research we have is that everyone should be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Right. And possibly, yeah. you know, most people would benefit from cutting down on animal products and eating more plants. Not everybody, but most people. But still incorporating some. Cutting out altogether means that we need to be thinking about supplementation or food fortification, which then come, becomes a little bit more complicated and needs some tailored and individual prescriptions. Yeah, and this whole sort of notion of, of supplementation, there's a vast variety of choice. And how do you even start if you, I mean, how do you know you have a deficiency? Is it something that people in general should be going to seek out to, to check their blood levels for, you know, vitamin D? That was a new one to me. I never knew that for eons I'd been low on vitamin D, yeah. assuming that, I've been, I was tested at a random point in time. I'm very, very low. How, how could a, you know, how could, could people check in to make sure that their, their nutrition levels are balanced? So it's, the problem is that mm. the supplement industry is very poorly regulated. So anyone can sort of say, oh, I've designed the supplement and you should all take it and it's the best thing for anybody and everybody. Um, so there's very poor regulation in the field. What I would say is if, you, if your skin is healthy, if your hair is healthy, if your nails are healthy, if you haven't got mouth ulcers, if you feel well, if your energy levels are good, the chance, and, and you eat a balanced diet, you include food from all food groups, the chances of you being deficient in anything are really slim. Mm. If you are cutting out food groups for whatever reason, so even carbohydrates, but especially things like animal products, if you notice you have recurrent mouth ulcers, if you get infections very often and frequently, any kind of infections in your body, if you notice changes to your skin or your nails or your hair, these are all signs that maybe your body is lacking somewhat in some nutrients and it's definitely worth getting it checked out. Right. And so the best port of call, I guess it's much easier to do in the private sector because otherwise you'd turn up at your GP saying, I think, well, presumably the signs and symptoms, but um, direct, for direct checks, is there such a thing as like, just being able to go for a blood analysis to, to check your levels, and that's something a dietitian would do? So you absolutely can. Mm. It's not necessarily something a dietitian would do. So when people mm. come to my clinic and they show any yeah. signs of deficiency, I'll write to their GP and say, please, can yeah. you check these things for me? Um, there certainly are mm. nutritional therapists and nutritionists who would sell you very expensive blood tests, and I've seen all kinds yeah. of crazy things working in the mm. private sector. Your patients will come to me with... 25 page booklets of all these blood test results and they've been told you know they're deficient in this when actually they're within the normal range or they've been told you know this suggests you might get cancer or you've got cancer based on mm. someone who's not got any medical education at all just looking at some blood test results that they've paid 500 600 pounds for and there's some yeah. real ethical problems in that for me yeah. which is why I always work on the basis that if someone if I assess that someone's likely to have a nutritional deficiency I'll get the doctor to to look at it yeah. rather than me asking them to spend more money. Mm, well, speaking of exp expensive blood tests, I'm aware of um, at least one company, if not more, who do genetic testing to try and find out, from my understanding, uh, what food types sit well with you. Mm, mm. Um, there's probably a better scientific way of explaining <laughs> that, but it's basically genetic, uh, genetic testing for uh, compatibility with certain foods. 
Um, and I think we, I'll tag on with that. They make recommendations for diet and also exercise. Is this something you've come across and what, what is your view on it? Yeah, absolutely. Again, these companies generally work with the nutritional therapy, kind of alternative therapy market right. rather than dietitians. Yeah. I don't know any dietitians who would mm. use those companies. There are some really mm. responsible companies who do some really great work in mm. that sector. So I work with a company called Nell who do some lovely work looking mm. at um, all kinds of different genetic variants. But ultimately, we're just looking at what are you, are you at a higher or lower risk of things like heart disease and diabetes and these really commonly mm. tested mm. things that we're really sure about in the genetic testing world, as opposed to all of these other things that we're really not sure about. So things like food intolerances, things like, yeah. apart from celiac disease, which is very well tested, any of the other kind of high risk diseases, there's just such a small pool of people that have been tested for it. We just can't be sure about it. Mm. So testing someone's blood, testing someone's hair, any of those things to test for deficient, to test for, um, uh, intolerances or any of those things, it's really, really inaccurate and it's really not yeah. the way to go. Yeah, and the skin prick tests as well. So I've been through, I've been through those. My daughter's been through those, and it, it's merged. We're not allergic to anything, and yet we are. I know that I'm allergic to certain things. Mm. Um, MSG is one thing. Um, it just doesn't. If it's if food has it, I know that I can't. I will, I will break out in a rash. I know she's intolerant to to milk products because she's. She's got the symptoms, but these tests don't seem to, to reveal it. So we kind of gave up on that and was hoping that this next generation of, of, of gene testing. Um, so very, very curious, very um, interested to, to, hear, mm, to hear your view on that. Yeah. And it's important to differentiate yeah. between allergy and intolerance. So, of course, some of the particularly yeah. specifically mediated allergies, you know, that go through a particular pathway in your immune system, they will flag up on the skin prick testing, but other ones won't necessarily. Mm. So there's sorts of different types of allergy. There's such a thing as a conditional allergy. So sometimes if you have had alcohol or you've done lots of exercise, you may react yeah. more to something because your immune system's already doing some other things. Yes. Um, we have yeah. an issue in sort of the allergy community, I guess, at the moment where people are saying they're allergic but they mean intolerant and that can yes. then drive yeah. restaurants and food trucks and everyone else to be less serious take things less seriously mm -hmm. when they're marking their allergens and of mm -hmm. course someone who has a, a true allergy an anaphylactic allergy if they are treated as though they have an intolerance and they're just being a bit fussy then there's a real risk there for people and i think we need to be careful with this sort of trend for lots of people to be cutting out things because they think that they've got symptoms and I'm not downplaying the symptoms that you say you, mm. you, that you have it's just that there are mm. you know it's very trendy to cut out gluten for no real reason at the moment and right. those sorts of things and it's really important yeah. that we are careful a little bit about the language around allergy intolerance and sensitivities and things like that. Yeah. And then speaking about cutting things down I mean lots of different kind of trends and and and, and fads is, is it something, is there, I wonder if there's a psychological element to it as well, um, in the sense that, you know, being able to have control over your, your, your eating habits, etc. And it gives you a, a plan and a set of rules in which to, to follow. So regardless of whether it's the paleo or a, a Atkins mm -hmm. diet, at least it's something that you kind of what, align yourself to and, and continue. How much do you notice in your clients sort of psychological difficulties manifesting themselves out in, um, in, in eating? Yeah, I mean, yeah. very commonly, um, particularly with the women who I work with, and it's mainly women who I work with, yeah. who've had this sort of pattern of yo-yo dieting, who've tried every diet under the sun, nothing works. You know, they've maybe spent years disliking their body and on a diet and all this kind of stuff, you know, getting to a place where they'll try anything, they'll do anything, and it's one di one diet one week and the next the next, and it, everything's failing, nothing's working yeah. for them, that kind of real diet culture trap that we live in. I think there's a really interesting shift in that women, I think, have generally always been interested in diet, and typically women are a bit more engaged with these kinds of things, but now there's some real polarization within the male communities as well, and you, men often like to identify by being a paleo person or a keto person or an intermittent fasting person or a vegan or whatever their kind of little food tribe is at that time. I think there's some danger in that, in that I think it can, one, create this sort of controlling uh, behavior around food, but it can also mean that it, actually, if your body's not functioning very well on that diet, you don't respond to it. You don't listen to your body's needs. You don't think, oh, actually, I probably need some more fiber or I probably need some meat today or I might need some fish or whatever it is. You mm -hmm. end up 
being very true to your community and resisting, you know, listening to everyone who says the same things as you is sort of an echo chamber of nutrition information. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, as we were saying at the beginning, you know, nutrition is so broad. Cutting out food groups always leads to, out, has consequences, always has a consequence. Yeah. And we just need to be a little bit careful about the messages that are within those communities. And that food tribalism mm -hmm. is very real. Yeah. I'm going to go launch straight into asking you about what you eat and, and, and drink. And, and do you feel that that's, is it is your kind of, um, your, 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 your pattern, is that something that's evolved for you or do you work deliberately on it? Do you experiment with different things? So I love food. Food is an important part of my life. It's an important part of my quality of life. I love to eat out with friends. I love to cook for people I love. It's a very important part of my quality of life. I notice that when I am less happy, I'm more restrictive with what I eat. I exercise a lot. My relationship with exercise can be a bit challenging. Um, when I'm happier, I'm a bit fatter and I feel good about it and it's nice. And I can look back at those pictures of myself thinner and think actually I was really unhappy then. Mm. And now I'm happier. And I think, um, you know, health is really important. And I always eat lots, that, the real rules that I absolutely have is that I always want to eat lots and lots of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and have nice lean protein. And I eat lots of nuts and seeds and healthy things. But I also enjoy wine and I enjoy social eating. And I, I, I'm very careful not to be restrictive about those things because it's mm -hmm. an important part of my life. Um, is it time consuming to eat healthy? Do you have to put a lot of planning and effort into it? No, I think that's a myth, you know, and I think mm. there's obviously there's degrees of healthy and the work that I do is generally helping sick people to get better as mm. opposed to helping healthy people get healthier. So if mm. we're talking about um, someone who's already very healthy, who wants to get really healthy, yes, that can be more time consuming. That can mean that there's more cooking at home, there's more preparation, more complex ingredients, those kinds of things. But if you're talking mm. about someone who's you know, running around having a hectic lifestyle who's maybe um, relying on foods from cafes and shops all the time, then you can certainly take that from a less healthy picture into yeah. a healthy picture with no extra time and effort, really. Yeah. How did you get into this field? I, yes, yeah, so I was a very strange 15-year-old child who knew exactly what I wanted yeah. to do. And yeah. I was really interested in food and cookery, and I was really mm. interested in science. And um, I, I struggled a bit at school. It turns out later, I was recently, not recently, mm. last three years, um, tested and diagnosed with dyslexia and dyspraxia. But I didn't know that when I was younger. So growing up at school, I was sort of not, the, I was one of three sisters and I was not really the smart sister. I was sort of struggling. And so I didn't think I was going to do very well in my GCSEs. And actually what happened was I just decided to teach myself everything in my spare time that I'd missed in the curriculum and everything else. And I ended up getting really good GCSE grades and mm. particularly in sciences. And uh, so I realised I could do anything I wanted to do. Mm. So I studied, yeah, went straight to university after A-levels mm. um, and then went straight into the NHS and just worked. So mm. I got really interested in um, colorectal surgery in that area, partly because I was working with some really inspirational nurses and consultants in the hospital I was working in, but also because um, there are a group of people who you can make such a big difference to their quality of life who are underserved by the health service. You know, if you mm. see a surgeon, often they sort of do a cut and shut job and they've done their bit and off you go to live your life. Yeah. But there's always consequences to that. And um, the work that I do with that particular cohort of patients, I, I feel mm. like it's very worthwhile. It makes me very happy. I feel like I can make a big difference. And that's mm. something that I find incredibly fulfilling. Is it a career that's easy to go into if someone's a bit let on later on in life who wants, is not satisfied with what they're doing? And, and, and here's how enjoyable a career as a dietitian could be. Is it something that you can make a switch towards or do you have to have the early kind of degree? So absolutely. And we used yeah. to get a lot more mature students on the programs um, because it used to, the tuition fees used to be paid by the NHS. Mm. They're not anymore, mm. unfortunately, which uh, restricts people who are trying to do a career change or makes it harder, I would say. You have to have two sciences at A-level. So people might have to do an access course, access to sciences, access to medicine, mm. or they may have to do A-levels again if they need to. And then it's a three or four year degree, depending on which university you choose. Um, during that degree, you'll have to do six, nine months worth of, uh, well, eight months worth of full-time placements in hospitals. So it's difficult if you've got a young family, it's more challenging. But when you come out, you've got a qualification that means you can go straight to work in the NHS and you've got a set career path. So it's not like you're kind of coming out and not really sure what you're going to do. You're straight into doing the job that you want to do. Yeah. And that's, in that sense, it was absolutely worthwhile. Yeah. 
Well, I guess because not many people know at 15 that that's what they I want know, yeah. to do. So, um, and then uh, just in, in terms of your, your earlier experiences, um, you didn't know that you didn't dyspraxia, dys, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dyslexia, and, dyslexia yeah, yeah, and yeah. ADHD. Yeah. Those were later discoveries. Yeah. Um, I guess two, two parts to that. Um, first, there were no signs er, early on or it was just unidentified? They absolutely were, and I can remember in primary right. school, um, my teacher said to my parents that they wanted me to be tested, and I can remember mm. saying I didn't want to be, because mm. at that time there was still quite a lot of stigma around these kinds of things. Mm. And, you know, it turns out that I'm smart enough to compensate for it and did well in my GCSEs yeah. and A-levels, yeah. and then I got a master's and have worked as a lecturer and researcher and, you know, been able to cope. Yeah. But... Um, yeah. There were things that I was struggling with in my last academic post and my mentor said, you know, mm -hmm. if you were a student, we would say, do you want to get tested? And I thought, it's probably time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was interesting because, uh, I, yeah, I always sort of knew and I always was struggling with things. But I don't think that I would have gone as far as I did academically if I had known when I was younger. I think it would have made me think, mm -hmm. actually, I don't think that's for me. Whereas now I kind of reached the sort of peak of academic work and what I was doing and what learning about my diagnosis actually just made me think, well, here's all the things I'm really good at and here's all the things I'm never going to be good at. And I'm OK with that. Let me do all these things and let me not do any of these things anymore. And now, you know, 90 percent of the work I do is things I love, things I'm good at, things that I feel positive about. And, uh, you know, I pay an accountant and I pay for admin support and the things that I'll never be good at. And that mm. makes me really happy. And did um, did having like the, the the kind of hovering of the of the labels was that helpful or or not? Sorry, in what way? What do you mean? In the sense that you know, uh, having a descriptor like dyslexia or ADHD, do you think that is helpful to know that you think you have it, or is it irrelevant because you're still able to push past it and clearly have done earlier on? I now find it really empowering to have that mm -hmm. information because. In the past, mm. I used to think, well, I can't do that, and that means I'm stupid. Everyone else can do it, and I can't do it, and mm. therefore I'm stupid. Whereas mm. now I think, well, I can't do it, and I'll never be able to do it, and it's not because I'm stupid, it's because of this, <laughs> and I feel okay yeah. about that. Yeah. Even things like following direction, like map directions and things, I really struggle with, and it's frustrating. And I can remember in the past, you know, if I was late for things or I got a bit lost, I would get so annoyed with myself and feel like, what's wrong with me? And now I kind of know what's wrong with me and I feel okay about it and it's yeah. it's fine and there's nothing I can do and I just have to laugh about it or compensate for it and leave a bit earlier, whatever it might be. Mm. Yeah, it's been it's been mm. kind of quite transformative in my life finding out and certainly it's made me, it, when I, at the time when I found out I was trying to make a decision about whether I wanted to do my PhD and apply for funding to do my PhD or if I wanted to sort of push this consultancy door and think about my media work a bit more and whether I wanted to go down that path and it, you know... I just thought, actually, let me see what I'm see this area. Let me explore this a bit more because actually, sitting down and doing a PhD for three years is probably really hard. Mm. And also, who mm. am I doing it for? Who am I trying mm. to prove I'm smart to? I, I'm, I'm all right. And if we can move on to the subject of therapy, have you had any therapy? Have you any views and um, attitudes towards? So therapy? yeah, absolutely. So I have had therapy personally, mm. and I think it's transformative for people and I think it makes a huge mm. difference to people's lives. I'm very pro-therapy with my clients when I'm working with mm. patients I think you know, there's only so much that I can do as a dietitian. We have some psychology training, I've done my CBT courses and I've done like, extra things to make sure that I'm uh, capable of dealing with the emotions that come alongside eating yeah. and food but I'm very often like I think you need to see a therapist and here's some amazing ones that I would recommend yeah. because yeah. you know my own experience was that was so positive and, and so mm. positive for me. And I can see the benefit, you know, can see identify people who need it, and I think, mm. or who would benefit from it. And I think that that's really helpful to me as a practitioner. It's really helpful to me as a dietitian to be able to say, you know, I've been through this journey, yes. and I can see the benefits personally. How old were you, and how did you um, know that it was something that you wanted to do and explore? So unfortunately, I was mm. in an abusive relationship um, for a couple of years, and it was horrendous mm. at the time. But the uh, the, you know, going through the process of having therapy, I had two therapists, one through a domestic violence charity who were amazing. And I also mm. had some group support with other women who'd been through similar experiences. Mm. And that was also so empowering mm. and so helpful for me. Um, mm. 
and I learnt so much about myself. I feel like I'm a much truer version of myself now than I was before all of this happened. I think mm. it's been amazing to be able to open up and understand my childhood and how that impacts mm. on my uh, adult life and my decisions and how I behave and the things that I do and the choices I make. Mm. And um, as much as the catalyst to going into therapy was horrendous and yeah. I wouldn't you know, choose yeah. it or, or recommend it to anyone, mm. <laughs> I'm grateful that I've got to where I am now. You know, I feel that therapy has been hugely helpful for me in lots of different ways. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Therapy Lab. If you feel ready to transform your life with therapy, we're offering 10% off a first session with any therapist on harleytherapy.com to our listeners. Just use the code THERAPYLAB when you book your session on harleytherapy.com. How long was the therapy for, both individual and group, and what was your relationship like with the therapist and facilitator? So the first um, little block of therapy that I had was with a lady who I chose because I'd already found yoga uh, and found meditation very helpful, and she sort of was in that kind of alternative therapy type space, a trained and qualified uh, therapist counsellor, and um, she was wonderful. She taught me... Um, to stop blaming myself for what happened. You know, I was some narcissistic abuse where somebody, you know, you believe that it's your fault that these things happen. And she managed to get me to distance myself emotionally and physically from my ex-partner. And that was transformative for me. And I would say save my life. I think I would still be, probably have gone back to that situation if I hadn't have had therapy at that time. Um, and then this, I had a bit of a break. I thought I was fine. You know how you do. <laughs> I'm fine now. I'm all grown up. I know what I'm doing. Um, and it wasn't until about a year later, maybe, where I realised I was still really struggling. I realised I was still believing the things that that person had taught me about myself and what I wasn't, wasn't capable of. Even and, though you weren't together. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and we hadn't had any contact for a long time at that mm -hmm. point as well. Um, so I actually spoke to the NHS, uh, mental health support people. And I told them this story on the phone about what had happened and why I wanted help. And the poor girl who took that call was just like, well, I think well, you need to tell me who he is and I need to call the police immediately oh. and all this. It was just big. Yeah. It was very much, I think, with those kinds of situations, in order to get on with your life, you don't tell yourself the story all the time. So when you tell someone else the story and they hear what you're saying, they feel very scared and very worried for you. And, you know, rightly so. But what mm -hmm. she did was say, you know, there's a very long NHS waiting list, but you should get in touch with this domestic support, this is a domestic violence charity. And I rang them and they were amazing. Mm. And I had three months weekly um, specialist therapy with um, a therapist there. And she, mm. yeah, was incredible. Really, really helped me to understand all my thoughts and feelings and behaviours and all that kind of stuff. And that was brilliant. Um, during that time when I was in therapy, he actually, the, my ex-partner actually got back in touch with me and they supported me in going to the police, which was, again, very empowering, mm -hmm. very positive. First time I'd been to the police and disclosed to mm. anyone. Um, mm. And the, I was also having group therapy at the time with other women who'd been through the same sorts of abuse and, and domestic violence situations. And the facilitator was wonderful and very supportive. And mm. it was great to see women who had kind of some who are still in those abusive relationships, all the way from that to people who'd been out of abusive relationships for 10 years, but still wanted to be able to have contact and to talk about how it's impacting them and that sort of thing, which was, mm. for me, as someone who comes from a background where nobody's been in that sort of situation, yeah. you know, it's just obviously not yeah. true, but that's certainly in my yeah. family, it was not something that was known that was going on anywhere. Yeah. Um, to be with other women who'd been through that. Women from all walks of life, yeah. women who were doing incredible things. And it was, you know, it was amazing for me to be in that environment and to share those stories. Mm. And it made me really angry because the patterns of abuse are the same every time. You know, it's always the same things. And I just didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. I was so naive yeah. to it all. Um, yeah. But that was, yeah, completely transformative for me. Again, mm. their support. Um, when he started contacting me again and he was uh, stalking me again, they said, you know, this will escalate. It was those group, the group of women who said to me, this escalates, this sort of similar thing happened to me and this is what happened, you need to go to the police. And if I hadn't have had them, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been brave enough to do that. And, you know, unfortunately that will, there's no, there's no chance of any conviction for all of that stuff. You know, there's uh, mm -hmm. one of those classic situations where actually it will never be able to come to any sort of conviction. But um, I'm so glad I went to the police. I'm so mm -hmm. glad I shared that story. I'm so glad they took it seriously. 
and it's been you know that that sort of whole thing has really helped me to put it behind me although I would say that I still struggle to you know I still struggle to not let it impact me and not let it be part of my story so I'm trying mm -hmm. very hard now to talk about the lessons I learned from it and how positive it's been, yeah. how positive it's been for me as a therapist to help other people, mm -hmm. how positive mm -hmm. how it's taught me so much about myself and my life and what mm -hmm. I need and what I don't need. It's empowered me to say what I need and what I don't need in a way that I just wouldn't have been able to before. But again, mm -hmm. I'm still not, I don't think I'll ever be grateful for what happened, but I'm very grateful for the lessons it taught me. Of course. And I mean, obviously, the whole the whole nature of the situation was very challenging, very difficult, and, and painful. Were there difficult moments in the therapy as well, or was that all positive and transformative? It was hard work. Mm. It was hard work, and it was especially hard work um, uh, in the initial instance where there was so much trauma that I'd buried. There was so much that I'd forgotten happened, and then you know you're you're going through the process of having therapy, and suddenly. Yeah, a very inconvenient moment, moment, you suddenly remember some awful traumatic thing that's mm -hmm. happened, it comes back to mm -hmm. you, um, which was diff very difficult, you know, very difficult at times when I was trying to hold down an important and high, you know, uh, highly regarded job and all this kind of stuff, which was very difficult. Um, and at that time, I had to take a break from seeing clients privately because I just couldn't take on their emotional issues as well. I just couldn't yeah. cope with it alongside my own problems. So. Yeah, that was at times very hard. I think um, very important to remember to take some time after each session and not just going mm. straight back into whatever thing you've got to do next and that next mm. thing on your to-do list. Talking to my friends as well was very helpful. So I'm very privileged to have some very close friends mm. now who I didn't have before this situation who um, I can talk about my feelings and thoughts with and who I can ring up and say, mm. I've just come out of therapy. Can I just run through with you what we were talking about? I want to keep it. I want to hold on to the things I've learned and the things that I've shared today. Um, and I can remember times when I was sort of learning to explore why I thought things and why mm -hmm. I felt things. And, and I can remember being on the tube and I'm not really a public cry. I'm not really a crier. I haven't been a crier and cried a lot in the last few years, but not traditionally. And um, I was on the tube and I was trying to understand why something had hurt me so much. Something had happened, a, a sort of separate incident, but it caused me a lot of pain. And I was trying to find why does that why has that hurt me so much why is that so triggering for me where does that pain come from and I can remember kind of rooting down and rooting down and finding it and then just bursting into tears on the tube because I'd learned this sort of mm. process of being able to explore my thoughts and feelings and then doing it on my own and suddenly was very emotional and it was it was difficult positive useful but difficult so learning a whole new set of um, yeah, yeah emotional totally and totally and yeah. it was interesting because um when I was a child, I was I'm one of three girls, very happy, comfortable, middle class upbringing, everything on paper, lovely and fine. But my mum, uh, my dad worked away and my mum was on her own at home with us, with three girls under five at one point. And so my emotional deans in particular were not uh, being the middle child, but were not very, not very, very well catered for all the time. Mm. So if I was angry or if I was upset, it was my parents' way of managing that was to, to go, go to your room. Go to your room until you've calmed down. Not, let's talk about your anger, let's talk about your feelings, let's talk about what's going on. Very little discussion of mental health yeah. in my upbringing and yeah. very little space for me to have feelings about things. And then I went into a very long-term relationship at the age of 15 uh, for 12 years with a guy who was, we were young, we didn't know what we were doing, but I ended up in this kind of treadmill of looking after him, making sure he was okay. And again, my feelings, my thoughts, not being important, not being very relevant in that situation. And, you know, you just see these patterns mm. of behavior coming through. And now I've been on, I'm single for four years, wonderful four years of my life. Mm. And now I look after my own feelings and everything yeah. all the time, which is really nice, but I would really like to have a partner. <laughs> and it's hard yeah. to know, like, I think that's the kind of next stage of my journey in terms mm. of uh, dealing with what's happened to me in the, the past is sort of thinking, yeah. okay, how does this look in the future? What do I want? And yeah. being comfortable with what I want and what's important to me. And how do you look after yourself now? What is your kind of your, what is your well-being toolkit look like? In, in, uh, aside from good food and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so careful now with my well-being. So I think yeah. my social support is, my friends are so important to me. My, you, my, uh, people in domestic violence situations are very often isolated by their, ex their by their partners, and that's what he absolutely did. Mm. And I have friends who are a hundred percent my team, who I speak to every day, who are you know I'm so grateful for them in my life. And 
So my friends are very important, talking to them, leaving mm. space and holding space for other people to share with me, but also for them to, for me to be able to share with them. Um, I'm very keen on exercise. Exercise is very useful for me. I box now, which is empowering, useful, but also just amazing exercise with a community of people who, uh, you know, care about whether you're there. Like, why aren't you here? What's going on? Are you all right? And, you know, checking in as a sort of fat boxing family, which is lovely in a proper boxing gym mm. in Br Brixton. Um, so exercise is important. I meditate, I still practice yoga regularly. That kind of stillness is so important, checking in with my body, what do I feel today? I've recently started practicing gratitude more regularly, which I find so useful. You know, that little moment mm. where you wake up in the morning before everything starts, before the chaos begins and just checking yeah. in with my body. How do I feel? Have I slept well? I'm in a lovely warm bed, that's really nice. What's gonna happen today? Kind of that mm. Jill check-in moment is very important to me. So mm. I, th I suppose they're probably my main things. That's lovely. It's quite a lot there also. Oh, yeah, I'm very yeah. conscious about anything. that yeah. I think once you've been through, if you've been through these kinds of experiences and you come out the yeah. other side, we're so, anyone who I speak to who's had similar experiences to me, you're so conscious of things that impact you. You know, you don't ever want to go back to somewhere where you yeah. feel stressed and anxious every day. And so, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully you'll inspire a lot more people to to adopt similar levels of, of good self-care. So thank you so much for sharing that. Where can people reach you? City Dietitians, which is citydietitians.co.uk? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And all my social media is under Sophie Dietitian. So that's where I am available. I'm very happy to share experiences. I think it's important. Well, I really appreciate you sharing today. Thank you so much, Sophie. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Therapy Lab. To find private, affordable therapy in person around the UK or online by video from around the world, visit harleytherapy.com today to start therapy as soon as tomorrow. If this is your first listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and all good platforms.